hope uh, you guys can hear us loud and clear. And um, I think uh, big thank you to all the panelists. Uh, special thanks to Salid and Anil uh, for traveling from Delhi. And um, just to tell you, I think this is our, like at least my first physical event uh, after COVID. So good to be back uh, in a conference room. Um, while driving, I was thinking like, what could be that one thing uh, which could introduce the panel in one shot? Um, and what, could I, I, what I could write on my notes was, um, these are the programmatic pioneers of India, right? And we are, it's a privilege to have all of them here together on the stage. So super excited, thrilled to be uh, having a discussion with them. Um, so I started my digital journey almost like 14 years ago. Uh, and the media was used to, the media buying was used to happen in a very different way, like a TV and a newspaper through insertion orders. Um, I would say release orders, like that was the terms we were used to uh, use. Um, and unfortunately, previously, marketers also didn't have access to data to plan, forecast, you know, launch uh, any of the campaigns. Um, I think understanding the right audience at the right time, uh, at the right place, actually gave the true birth to programmatic. And I think programmatic, as Naval mentioned, is almost crossing like 50 to 60% of our digital universe today, uh, which means it's getting important for everyone, for marketers, for all the data partners, for double verify, for trade desk, for agencies. It's taking the center stage. And um, I think uh, programmatic has also led to one very beautiful thing, which I feel is choices, right? You are no more bound by one or two things that you can pick up. Now you have like entire universe that you can actually choose in from. Uh, with that background, I think uh, probably I'll uh, lean on the panel and I think what we guys thought was, we'll start um, this panel from very basic understanding of programmatic, right, to set the baseline, right? Um, so Anil and Mitesh, probably I'll start with uh, Mitesh, right? Uh, just help the audience understand what are the true benefits of programmatic versus direct, and Mitesh, you are leading a massive uh, publisher brand right in the country, um, you know, moving in from traditional newspaper to now fully digital ecosystem. So I would love to hear your thoughts on what are the true benefits that you feel a publisher have uh, while using programmatic versus direct? I think, uh, <coughs> uh, thanks uh, Tejinder for this question. What, what, you know, I would like to keep it simple. What, uh, uh, what it means for the advertiser is choice. Uh, it means simplicity of execution. It also means transparency, and it also means measurability, right? So if we put all things together, if I have to sum up, these are the absolutely four things that uh, uh, programmatic advertising offers. From a publisher perspective, I, I know uh, this uh, panel is largely f an agency panel, I probably and I'm the odd person out uh, speaking out from the publisher perspective. But uh, from a publisher perspective, it uh, really opens up, um, opens up the uh, inventory in a very uh, safe way, especially large trusted publishers like us in the Stan Times, for example, uh, and uh, allows us to interact and reach out to more advertisers which we otherwise would not have been able to connect with. So, uh, you know, that just opens up um, uh, not just uh, the number of advertisers, but also uh, providing advertisers various choices. And the panel, um, the fireside chat before this spoke about uh, when you are buying on programmatic, you are largely buying audiences, you're not buying uh, individual websites. And therefore, for us, which we have almost 13 or 14 different properties, and of course publishers like us, can actually offer everything that we have in one go, as long as we are able to offer the audiences which the advertiser is seeking. Uh, fantastic, Mitesh. Anil, we are troubling you again, um, you know, after panel. I, 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 love to, I love to speak on programmatic, but uh, when you ask about the advantages or benefits, I think I'll, I can draw up a list of advantages, but if, I, if you want me to pick, I'll pick Two, which maybe will encompass uh, a lot of them. The first, I would say, is media consolidation benefit, uh, Tej, right? Today, with new channels coming up, 
coming within his fold, as I was saying earlier, right? You literally can today run an omni-channel campaign, a full fun funnel campaign, right? That is, the advantages that, that is the advantage that programmatic can bring to the table. And media consolidation has its own set of advantages, right? Uh, benefits, it's huge reach, right? Uh, you save wastage on, uh, uh, on, on impressions, right? Cost per reach goes down, lot many things. The second, I, I think we should look at programmatic as a data enabler. And that is one thing which is making programmatic very, very potent. Going forward, I think programmatic, so with programmatic, you can harness the first party data, second party data, third party data, right? And programmatic is the only tool where you can see bind creative and data together to power your personalization, to power your DCO story, and so on. So I think these are two basic ones which I can right, bring it right here. Superb. I think, um, thanks, Anil. Um, Vishal, I think I'll lean on you for this, uh, which is slightly a uh, flip question to this. Like, what are the top two programmatic myths, right, um, that that people think are around? Um, it would be good to like get your sure. point of view on it. A uh, few years back, the myth was that it's a cheap inventory, <laughs> it's a leftover inventory, it's a very sasta inventory, which is not true. That's first myth. Amazing. Yeah, you're with me? 100%. I think everyone. <laughs> Second myth was that programmatic is death to creativity, which is again not true. You plug in a DCO, and you can really give the right messaging at the right audiences at the right time. I can keep going on. But there's one more, which I think is also a little important, Please. is uh, most of these advertise most of the marketeers actually look at the last click attribution and say that my sale has come from these sort of clicks but there is a lot of view through attribution which actually programmatic brings to the table which is quite ignored by most of it so maybe myth uh, or whatever little bit of a level up education that's required but these are some which come to my mind 100% i think thanks for putting it like very simply um, salel over to you please man yeah, uh, Vishal covered the right thing, which is like Sasta inventory, cheap inventory, and more importantly, like uh, the lower CPM. And it always happened, like we have seen, uh, I mean, six years, seven years, a lot of, uh, you know, advertisers, even from an agency perspective, like, you know, what are the best I can go through programmatic because I want to buy an inventory at a cheaper price. Like that's the biggest wrong myth from an industry perspective. Reason being, programmatic is the only channel where you can actually evaluate each impression, what you are buying through supply, what you are buying through DSP, or you are, whatever you are buying from any kind of sources, you will have that control. And more importantly, likewise, what uh, Anil and Nishitet mentioned about brand safety measures, because that is the only channel where you can control everything from one single platform, which is like omnichannel, you can create that. The second myth, which I really want to talk about, again, like we shall mention performance. Amisha is like, you know, Programmatic always work on the top of the funnel, right? It's not the scene. Reason being, programmatic is the only channel where you can actually plug. Say, for example, if you have search data analysis, you can use the learning, you can plug into programmatic and create an ROI model where which works from top to bottom of the entire funnel. Amazing. I think very real, very real time stories. And I'm just, uh, we were supposed to follow a, a certain order, but I'm just flipping the order, uh, leaving the thoughts from where Nachi and uh, Anil left. I think you guys just touched upon the cookie-less world, right? Uh, we are hearing a lot about cookies fading away. How will it impact India? Does it work in a web environment only, right? So I think uh, this is a this is a question across the panel, and uh, you know we can probably start from Vishal and go around the table. Vishal, like, what will be a cookie-less future look like, right, for agencies, advertisers? How are you guys planning to educate right your end customers, which is which is uh, which is an advertiser basically? So love to hear different different views. Uh, yeah, sure. So we we believe and we sort of educate our advertisers that embrace for change and embrace for the big impact that's coming in the cookie-less world. We all saw what happened uh, with this upgrade of iOS 14 with deprecation of cookie. One of the giant lost a lot of share. 
and now we've got a Google who came out with another, came out with the logic of flock, then fled, now topic, right? But these giants are sharp. They have tons and tons of data and tons and tons of signals to really come over this cookie-less world. And I'm sure uh, you know there's, there has to be some bit of a belief. And when it comes to the life, there's definitely going to be a huge change in the metrics. The CPAs, the CPCs, whatever the marketers follow, there's going to be a massive change. All we have to do is keep learning and embracing it. I think to my sense, uh, in my mind, uh, you know, it's also... <coughs> it's also important that uh, <coughs> uh, we need to be very clear about what, the, what are the matrices that we're chasing. And when we're pretty clear, when we start applying those in all our marketing campaigns, you'll probably see a lot of output and outcome coming in. And a clear answer to a cookie-less world is going to be 1P. It's going to be first-party data. And that's something that we probably talk and tell most of our advertisers that you know we need to be embracing this first-party data. And that is something that's going to overcome all the initial hurdles that you think you might face, but which is technically not a hurdle. It's just how you want to adapt it and optimize it and keep building over your one party, the first party data. Great. Um, thanks, Vishal. Perfect. Uh, Anil, over to you, please. Thanks, Vishal. So uh, as per my view, I think the age cookless future is really going to be bright. Right. I think uh, it's a blessing in disguise. We've all known that third party cookies, what, how good they were so far. Um, but we worked for the last two decades around third-party cookies. Uh, what I'll say is, uh, see, there will be challenges, right? But we also know that challenges breed innovation, right? And uh, what I feel, the cook as we s continue to step into cookless future, uh, the customer centricity that we see will go up, right? It will bring brands closer to the customers, it will also challenge marketeers to do justice to both privacy as well as, say, personalization. Yeah. And I feel while in an attempt to do that, right, it will usher in an era for responsible marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think cookie-less future will be all about data. I, I'm not saying just first-party data. All aspects of first-party data, it's data quality, data sanity, it's data stack, it's, it's second-party data, it's first-party data. Uh, your own understanding of your data scenario or the situation of maturity within the organization, right? It's complete alignment that is required within the organization, not just the marketing uh, fraternity or, or, or the uh, team, right? I think these are some of the key things that will crop up, right? Yeah, and I think um, I've read some of your articles, right, where you have been talking about zero-party data, right? Would love to hear your view on that. I think I'm personally amazed about it, but would be good for the audience. See, good point, this. So, uh, <laughs> I'm little against using this first-party data a lot. Sure. See, when, when, I, when we talk about first-party data, right, at the back of the mind is either email IDs, mobile numbers, device IDs. Cookie-less future will be all about knowing your customers, right? You know your customers. Do you know their desires, their intentions, their interests, right, their preferences? That is, what will you do by getting an email ID and mobile number? That should only be a byproduct, right? You start knowing your customers, you give them value, you will end up getting an email ID. But you should start knowing your customers. That is what zero-party data tells you, right? Gives you. They are, they are willingly giving you sharing information, not just uh, PII data, right? PII data will come at the end. But I think you've got to know them well, right? Yeah. That is where we are lacking. Amazing. And I think, I think the answer to that is data clean room. Yeah, clean it's not just consent. about first party data, but how you get all the signals from all the giants and enrich that data in a data clean room and then use it. Amazing. Like I think, uh, Salil, before we go to your right, if, if you know your customers well, you will spend the right amount of dollars to reach out to them, which eventually brings efficiencies, right? So the CFOs will be very happy saying the dollars are getting spent at the right level and the right audiences. Salil, your expert view, Absolutely. Please. Very well said, uh, because it's all about getting the consent. So once you have the consent, then obviously we can have consent management strategy as well, spe precisely uh, to have that data distribution model. Uh, 
Yes, cookie-less, it's an interesting topic for us. Still, we are awaiting what Google will be actually releasing the entire note at the end of 2023. But having said that, as, as a you know, uh, business, as a practitioners, we should accept that fact like we have to be future ready considering how the future is move, uh, uh, cookie is moving on. Uh, but I have uh, one question, I mean, like, do we really need cookie? Because 80% of our, you know, media is on mobile, right? So cookie, how cookie will be, like, if you want to do any kind of personalization, how, if you want to actually tap and create, because there are advertisers which has kept cookies for years, but doesn't know how to really use that as a personalized model for any of the campaign what they're doing in house. So it's all about an ask and accepting the fact, yes, there are solutions like programmatic, contextual uh, targeting, programmatic, in fact, uh, PI-based uh, identity solutions, a lot of things are there. It's all about maturely how we are using those solutions to precisely target and create that model and future proof ourselves. Great, and I think uh, Mitesh, uh, you come from a, a you know different background. Uh, you are the owners of the inventory. Um, how are you getting ready for the future as a publisher? So, see, I think. Uh, but first, just wanted to um, just wanted to address and put put some points on this as well. What I feel is that in a cookie-less future, uh, marketers will have to actually work very hard. Uh, make the creatives more hardworking creatives and actually go back to basics. Because a lot of times, you know, we've seen that, uh, okay, targeting, etc., will do what it is and what Vishal actually rightly put, saying that there is no substitute for a great creative and a great marketing thought. Um, uh, you know, the, the targeting, etc., uh, will be there or will, I mean, 15 years ago, there was no specific targeting. Brands still used to be sold. Of course, we we don't know what ROI meant at that point in time or how to measure it effectively. But uh, I think marketers will have to uh, go back to basics. That's that's critical critical uh, in, in, the, in, in this uh, uh, era of uh, cookie-less uh, world. And again, if as more and more, um, you know, uh, players are going to building first party data. I think uh, what is important is uh, you have to build for the future, which is the India data production bill is not too far away. Uh, my sense is, and what I hear from many other um, uh, knowledgeable players, is that uh, it is actually going to be a GDPR plus plus. India always does much, much better, and therefore, how do you build um, the consent management uh, platforms on top of it, build your CDP so that, um, or, or the first party data where uh, the consent management is, is really taken care of and uh, you are able to uh, build that into when you are building your uh, future. Um, as far as uh, uh, HT is concerned, I'm talking from a publisher perspective. Uh, we are investing significantly in actually um, building a customer data a platform stack. We are partnering with a few players to ensure that uh, we are building and investing in our own first party data. But more apart from that, we are also investing a lot in content. So we are a trusted publisher. Uh, so the question for us is constantly how do we um, continue and maintain our trust because trust is extremely important uh, in in this uh, cookie-less era. And therefore, investment in the right content which will attract the right kind of people and allow marketeers uh, to also advertise in a contextual environment because you know you can't take away the power of contextual environment as well and of course a plus b can be added to get a multiplier effect which is contextual plus uh, uh, plus uh, first party data targeting etc can really multiply uh, the advertising roi so a lot is happening in that direction as well we are also uh, investing in uh, enriching our first party data. So there are a lot of partnerships that we are getting into um, um, to get some of the signals, like intent signals. We don't have intent signals, so we are thinking of how do we get those intent signals right? How do we, in all, in, in, in a safe way, in a privacy safe way, uh, I, and that goes without saying. So, you know, I just wanted to underline that as well. Uh, and um, also focusing on newer products like subscriptions, newsletters, etc. So all these 
all this is going on at, at the back end uh, to ensure that we are able to deliver what the advertisers and brands are asking for us from us. Uh, great viewpoint, uh, Mitesh. Like before I get into, I think you've given me a beautiful segue to our next uh, discussion topic, which is, you know, uh, you know how how should consumers behave in a privacy safe environment? But uh, I was recently taking a plane somewhere, and uh, the person sitting next to me, and he was like, "No, I don't like to share my data with anyone. I keep my location services off all the time, and all that stuff." And uh, I was arguing with him, like, you unfortunately cannot live without it anymore. Like, you know, and uh, the moment we got off the plane, uh, I said, okay, let's switch off everything. Like, all, all excess of your phone for a minute. He got down and uh, he had to book a Uber. Unfortunately, the first thing he had to do was switch on his location data. He got stuck. And I was arguing with him that uh, today if your wallet, you lose your wallet, I think it's okay. Uh, you know. And actually, I lost my wallet last week, right? And I was still okay because I lost my license, came back in three days, lost my credit cards, was okay. But I think if I would have lost my phone, I would have been in a bigger, bigger trouble, right? And that shows, uh, you know, that how sometimes data is so important, right? And how a mobile phone, which we carry, is such an important uh, gadget than than something uh, old-fashioned like a wallet. So I think I'll go around the table to probably uh, check on. Uh, what are the steps that you know some of the marketers are taking um, in terms of you know building this privacy first world because we all know like consumers are getting more and more aware about what their data is how it needs to be used when I go for like a normal uh, you know offices if you have to do like entry at the gates I usually avoid giving my phone numbers I'm like this is more this is really precious now this 10 digit number right so uh, you know, help help the audience understand, uh, uh, Vishal, from you. What are the steps that a market needs to take to future-proof uh, their strategy in a literally a privacy-safe world? And thanks to our government for taking the steps in the right direction. Um, yeah. Look, from a marketing point of view, I think uh, marketers really are cognizant, and obviously they're taking a lot more steps of really using the data in a very uh, proper manner, as in it's not a irritant way of, you know, you abusing the data. Uh, lot of it is getting played crucially because it's again getting, whether it's a PI, and I'm referring to the digital first companies where they're really sitting on a lot of data and they have a first party, they have a PII or whatever, and anonymized data as well. It's quite very well linked to the CDPs, right? And a lot of CDPs are bringing in a lot more intelligence as to how has been the engagement with that data. And it comes back into the system for them to really understand whether should I be engage, engaging more with it or, not, or maybe a little lesser with it. So I think there have been lots of technologies which have really come and it's playing a very, very vital and a critical role. Uh, we've heard about the DMPs and giving you a lot more top of the funnel uh, insights on the anonymized stuff, but a CDP actually captures both. So that's something which has been one of the uh, off late, I mean latest, uh, maybe a year, year and a half back where most of these guys have been really getting into. But wherever there's a scale, wherever there's a huge data that's, uh, I mean probably most of the Amazons and Swiggies and Zomatos will have their own CDPs. But not too many marketers have got into it, but obviously we recommend this to the marketers who actually have a scale of data. Perfect. Uh, I think great. Um, Sal, probably your point of view. Uh, I think uh, each region has uh, their own set of data regulations, whether it's GDPR, CCP. So uh, yes, the, so the industry is actually, uh, I mean the industry body, they are creating a framework on focusing more on addressability as well as uh, you know data privacy laws and regulations. So uh, from an advertiser perspective, Yes, they need to understand what they are holding because that's a asset for them and how they can actually use those assets, how they are holding from the business perspective. And uh, obviously there are solutions like uh, data clean room, there are solutions like CDP, but why 
that CDP and data clean room solution is very, very imperative for the brand. Are they holding the first party data? Likewise, the zero party data, what we call about it, and how we can enrich through different modules within the programmatic space. Likewise, if we can use it for any contextual targeting, if I create any identity solution with any of the platform, and more importantly, like, you know, how the data can be enriched through other, you know, services like ADH, where you are aggregating all the data into different levels and getting that learnings and re, you know, uh, using those learning across different campaigns. So it's more of like uh, creating that solution under one hood with the programmatic channel. And uh, yes, uh, also want to talk about IAB because uh, they are again creating an industry framework, especially from the supply or publisher side of uh, business. Yes, uh, having ads.txt, having uh, seller.json from an ad, you know, uh, fraud prevention matrices, which eventually help all the, you know, partners when it comes to the DSP, SSP, or from an advertisers to stitch together and understand if we can have that one channel where we can actually control and audit what we are actually buying from one uh, DSP. So it's more of like engaging, eng engaging and creating a standardization process across industry to have that development. And also, as uh, Denso, we have created our own proprietary tools uh, uh, in sync with uh, our global clean supply initiative, especially on the transparency, where model, uh, where the, if any of the advertisers they choose to run, so they can have that visibility, how much transparent they are getting into the supply, what they are buying, and how they are doing from a brand safety measurement. Excellent, I think great stuff. Thanks for sharing this, um, Salil. Anil, a, a very probably a sharper question for you, right? Um, uh, in this new age, uh, you know, privacy, safe environment, what are the different business models which are emerging these days, right? Uh, do you want to throw, throw some light? So I, I'll take a little different approach here. So when you say new business model, let's understand. So we have been seeing slides, presentations, where you see customer at the center, right? The new business model, as I foresee, Tej, is you should have consumer and consumer privacy at the center. And when you start building everything, the stack, the tools, technologies across, you get a new business model, right? You start with privacy-focused technologies, tools, right? You, you uh, st start testing future-focused, which is privacy-safe privacy solutions, right? Uh, like AI-based solutions, second-party data, contextual data, right? You don't necessarily have to start with first party. First party is something that you can start your journey on if you have not been doing that, right? But there are enough and more solutions, browser solutions. For example, interest-based browsing solutions are available, right? You have Chrome uh, Topics, you have Chrome Fledge, you have uh, Microsoft Parakeet, right? You have conversion attribution solutions now. You have WebKit uh, Click Attribution, right? You have uh, Chrome uh, Attribution Reporting API. Right? You have even reward-based browser solutions. You must have all heard about Brave, right? What does it do? You, you, you are paid. You are paid what is, they call a basic attention token, right? Of seeing, when you watch an ad, they pay you a token of bat, right? So I think there are enough and more privacy-focused technologies, tools. I think those are the things that the new business model should start focusing on. But I'd just like to stress here, uh, again, taking a different approach, when a new child comes to your, or is about to come to your house, right, or home, what do you do? You start setting your house in order. Yeah. From my interaction so far, I'm seeing a mad rush of collecting first party data. Yeah. I would say, please start looking inwards. Please start assessing your situation, your data situation, where you are. If you have to go from place A to B, you need to know where you are currently, right? Yeah. That is something that I see missing in the industry. Frantically, everybody is rushing to collect first party data. You need to have, you need to see. So for example, a lot of clients I've met, they say, I've got millions of data. Do you know how, what portion of the data is actually consented to? When you do a consent audit, you'll realize 50% of the data to Gaya. Interesting. So I think there are a lot of things that you need to build or to look inwards before you start approaching with these new tools and techs. So uh, are, we, are we recommending to marketers that they should they do their data audit first kind of a thing? It's not only data audit. A neutral, very honest audit of the entire 
organization where they stand in terms of customer privacy, consumer privacy. Data audit is just a portion, your digital maturity, right? Data, uh, where is the data lying? What, what is the kind of data? What is the data sanity? Yeah. Right? All these things, and you need to know this. You need to put in a stack before you start collecting first party data, right? Where will you put them? You start collecting your first party data, you don't have Yeah, right? interesting. Right, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, just then, to add on, uh, I mean, we are the first agency who launched Brave in India on doing top uh, cohort-based targeting for, for one of our advertisers. But having said that, yes, precisely what Anil mentioned, uh, collecting, because we have seen uh, some s advertisers in our ecosystem, which they have collected enormous data, but the biggest challenge is like how to activate, because they are already paying, I would say, a rent, where they are actually storing that data in-house. And that became a challenge for you know the marketers itself because you are paying X amount to rest your data, which is like you're killing your marketing budget, right? So you have to understand where exactly and why we are doing this because it's not necessary you are collecting and you're resting until unless if it's not been used for that purpose. But there are DSPs where we can actually rest those data and can create a value how efficiently we can bring and use that medium, use that budget within the overall digital ecosystem. Awesome, I think, uh, love this. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes left, right? So probably try to uh, converge the discussion. Uh, can we go around the table and uh, share maybe one or two areas that marketers should watch out for or maybe like the pain points, uh, you know, when they are trying to accelerate growth on programmatic, let's say. Uh, Mitesh, you want to give it a stab? I think, um, uh, see, uh, for me, if there is one word where marketers should converge on, it's ROI, mm -hmm. and everything that relates to uh, ROI, which means that, um, you know, there were talks about uh, how um, ad fraud proof is uh, the programmatic campaign, um, you know, which websites or which sites or um, properties is the inventory delivered on and essentially how do you measure the return on investment whether it is a, a click or what attribution you give or whether it's conversions. Um, I think everything boils down to uh, just one word is effective ROI and all the things that you do uh, which encircle um, getting the best ROI of the from the campaign so just focus sharply on the ROI of course there are various parameters that go into um, delivering that ROI um, ad fraud um, uh, attributions etc great creatives targeting even again how narrow how broad etc all these are parameters that feed into just one word which is ROI so identify those parameters uh, and the various parameters can work differently for different brands, right? For some, creatives could be a very critical uh, element. For, for some, uh, attribution could be very critical element. So index those uh, and, and then identify what it does to your ROI. Fantastic. Um, I think uh, before we define anything from a KPI perspective, it's more of like uh, understanding how the medium can actually create value across mediums. It's not about your buying radio, I mean audio, it's not about your buying uh, video, even mobile, native, even CTV or uh, you know, digital out of form. It's more of like what is exactly from an advertiser, from a marketing perspective, so that they can invest each penny on the channels. Because why I'm saying that it's evident and when you talk to any advertiser, the biggest challenge is like, what type of buy should I re really buy? Is it a PG, is it a PMP, or I mean, if I go open exchange, then it comes to the remnant and the lower CPM. So ROI matrices are there because by default it has to be there. Reason being because it's a medium which need to be chosen and before choosing, understand. And it also happened like, I think it's more of like a ad pipe connect. 
Reason being, at, when I say I add pipe, it's all about the publisher connecting through the supply and through the programmatic DSP channel. Because it also happened, there is an advertiser who want to buy X publisher, but all through programmatic channel, but the publisher is not allowing the inventory to buy that medium. Right, so it's need, that connect need to be there then definitely. And I believe this is the only channel where you can actually deliver any set of KPI based on your marketing needs. Perfect, uh, Anil. So there are a lot of things, Tej, again, I'll just like to quote few, like uh, you need to have your safeguards in place, right? Safety, brand safety. And I know that adoption is not yet up there, right? And even if there are clients who are using these solutions, uh, they're not looking at the reports. Maybe reports at the end of a month, they're not taking action. I mean, uh, I'll not deliberate too much into it. Uh, this second, taking a leaf from what um, Salil said, right? Uh, knowing what programmatic can do for you, knowing as Naval everybody explained, right, the the benefits, the 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 what what kind of advantages a programmatic can bring to you. I'm sorry to say, but India is still a very heavy PG market. Yeah, right. Agree. What I want to say, if you want to truly extract the benefit, true benefits of programmatic, please start shifting to PMPs. That is how you'll actually see the actual benefits accruing to you, right? There's so much control, there's so much uh, targeting, the level of filters that you can apply. Plain vanilla PG should be a thing of the past, right? It's nothing but a replication of direct buys. There's no mind and brain going into it. So I think th there are a lot more, but I think uh, having brand safety in place and shifting monies, knowing. So once you know what programmatic can do for you, you're still not using it in the right way. I feel there's a change that should come about there. 100%. Uh, Vishal, please. You know, um, this is a disadvantage of taking the last uh, <laughs> round, and I'm going to echo all of them. Yeah. But a uh, couple of points, and some sharp points I'll make, sure. is, you know, one of the biggest pain pointers marketers need to have a right objective of what they want to achieve out of programmatic. Because yeah. I want to run a reach and frequency, but like leads not come. That can't happen. Yeah, right? agree. You've got to really have a sharper objective and a sharper way of setting up that programmatic campaign to get your right objectives. Point number one, pain point. You said, uh, what are the new, what is it? There was one more question you said. There were two questions. Uh, new ways to look out. What are the pain areas basically or like the trends to watch out? Uh, trends to watch out. I would say, and I'm going to echo what uh, Naval started off, connected TV is going to be massively big. Sure, interesting. In a couple of years, look, what's happening is your television uh, is, GRPs are diminishing. Mm -hmm. They're going down. There is a less time spent. Time spent is actually moving towards the OTTs and and uh, a lot more connected TV. Connected TV, I remember about six months back, I did a session on Pitch Madison where I said that connected TV is going to be the new trend. And uh, we were roughly at around 40 million. It's already crossed 55 million. Wow. Right? And in no time, probably connected TV is going to be much larger than life. In US, actually, yes. by the way, I was just talking to Siddharth. In US, the, re the revenues that connected TV makes. 100%. It's bigger than the whole addicts of India, by the way. Totally. Yes. Okay. So I think that's something that need to be what, uh, looking out for. And the second one, I would bet on uh, this uh, programmatic outdoor. That's another space that will, again, uh, really come up in a big way. Uh, not sure how quick that scale is going to be built with the kind of infrastructure that's required in the cities. But that's, a, that's another area which, where the monies are going to start diverting. 100%, I think, and if you learn from the Western markets, you're right, like, I think more, like, more than 50% of the budgets have actually moved to CTV, right? Um, big, massive change, and you never know, right? Country like India, like, moves in waves, right? You never know when that next wave is coming, um, right? I think we've got probably three minutes, which means, like, this is, this should be, like, quick and fast now uh, towards the end. So let me put a very simple question to all of you, and you've got probably 10 seconds to answer this. It should be more top of the mind for each one of you. What is the one word that you feel defines programmatic? Okay, so you, can, you have to pick up just one word uh, to simplify it for everyone. Programmatic stands for dash. 
let's go with uh, Vishal this time. Let's uh, give him the first mover's advantage, right? <laughs> automation. Yes, automation. Thank you. Nice. Efficiency. Efficiency, right? Perfect. Amnet. Sorry? Amnet. Amnet. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> ROI for me. ROI for Mitesh. I think probably I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I think decisioning, right, what probably Anil touched upon uh, is one for me. So thank you so much, guys. Uh, we're spot on time. Really appreciate your time. Um, thank you. Uh, questions, anyone, please? Yeah, uh, let uh, E4M decide. Yeah. Um, all, all happy. Um, I'm, I'm just so sorry. I might have to give someone else also a spot. Uh, but after you, if you can make it a quick one, we'll go ahead. Please go ahead. Quick. It's about the, you know, international business. Uh, like, uh, uh, is there any, uh, you know, for overseas brand, they want to, you know, use the problem with advertisement before they launch the product in India. Example, you know, Ica furniture brand, they have started business. So, whether there is any diplomatic uh, restriction to get the problem data, example, any South Asian, uh, you know, countries, now they have a stop, you know, the supply chain stop in a US and European market. So, they want to target Indian markets, consumer durables in our, you know, products. So, is there any uh, case study where overseas brands, they want to enter in business? Because nowadays, once they have data, they can find out the, uh, you know, national distributors and a much level, large level import they can do. So, I want to know about it. Thank Nothing you. comes on top of my mind for anyone. Uh, do you guys have any inputs? I, I can't read. I, I did not understand the question. Uh, of uh, A player wants to enter India? They want to enter India. Uh, and uh, earlier they want to do, you know, uh, innovation for the European, Europe, uh, uh, American brands. But now they have the supply chain broken over there. So in new innovation, they want to enter Indian markets. So they have a And they want to target whom? Yeah, all the biz consumer durables in a business and homes. So in India or outside India? They want to so look for Indian market. They have a success story in their own country. And many new innovation products, they were, they, earlier they launched for the European markets. But now European, earlier they launched in their European market, then they target Indian markets. Definitely there are solutions. You can target, I think you can target anywhere today, right? You can target consumers in any market with the help of a lot of, not only programmatic, but there are the channels. Is there any Chinese company like Alibaba, any company, is there any diplomatic restriction to share the you know, data uh, to their country? Because whatever data you got, it, is there any? Okay, uh, uh, just, just, just to cut it on that, again, why yeah. are networking only, please? Let's go ahead. I'm so sorry, I'm usually used to <laughs> moderating yeah, it. Hi. That's fine. Apologies. Good job, Bhavna. My name is Apoorv. I represent Greedy Game Media uh, as a programmatic media manager. So we were talking about cookies actually over here. And uh, the main, uh, I would say the jargons would be CDP, DMPs, like that. So uh, specifically the third party aggregators. So what would be their current stance, okay, if the cookies are gone? That is one. And uh, the second question would be the extension of that. If, because I recently came to know like Sports Kira has been collaborating with Permitive uh, for the first party data aggregation and it comes with a cost. So how would tier two, tier three publishers can actually afford that? I mean, what would be their strategy to make their first party data collectively available for the buyers so they can get the right, you know, ROI for that? Ooh, it's getting into strategy now. <laughs> okay, let's that is more of take like a quick supply. one. Yeah, quick one. So it's from the publisher point of view, right? Exactly. You'll have to exactly. choose, huh? <laughs> See, there's, just as we're talking about advertisers and agency perspective, right, there's a whole, see, this is going to impact the entire ecosystem, as you know, right? Publishers that have, have their own challenges to meet. When you talk about how to create, you already are having a lot of visits happening, right? Even there, people are talking about giving some value in exchange to your users who will leave some aspects of the, or, or some of their data to you which you can use. There are publishers who are signing up on the Identity Solution Initiative. For example, UID 2.0 OTDs, right? So there are a lot of things that a publisher can do. They need to, in order to get their inventory monetized or audiences monetized, you need to start knowing your customers also, just as we are talking about marketers. You need to look at your content. You need to engage them. You need to give some value so that they pass on some information of theirs to you. Then you start segregating, building it into audiences of a different nature, of different cohort, which you can start selling it to advertisers, right? The scale and challenges, all those will be there with everybody. But I think we need to start working on that front. Well, thank you so much. Okay, just one question, but only 
if you keep it in 10 words, the question, <laughs> not the answer, just 10 words. Let me see the effectiveness of that. I don't think I'll be able to do that. But quick, <laughs> concise. Good evening. I'm Benaifa Bilamoria. I'm with Jaguar Land Rover. Um, my question is regarding your second party data and third party data, which you spoke about, Anil. Thank you very much. That is something that we've been trying to do um, in a big way at our organization. And um, I wanted to know what's the best way to go about doing it. Because the ki so initially, um, through legacy marketing, you'd probably look at market research for qualitative data like this. But to do programmatic in a way where we can find out more details about the interests, the hobbies, the kind of uh, websites that our TG would be targeting and browsing and OTT platforms, et cetera. How do we go about um, doing this and which would be the best route to take is without about, really using or diverging our first party? second party data partners? Yes. So the, I think the best way to do is to first understand your own TG, right? Where, what kind of sites do they visit? What kind of, see, second party data is not, nothing but somebody else's first party data. Right, so you should have at least that visibility. If it's a, say, a parenting site, for example, is, is your TG, then zero in what are the top parenting sites. Talk to them. Uh, talk to them about what kind of visits, unique users. They they would be having their own categories, their own segments and cohorts. Right. If you find them relevant and do a handshake, ask them, do they have a, a solution in place or a tech in place where they can push. Uh, those segments to your programmatic DSPs, right? That is the way to go. You need to look at, because see, second party data is identifying those publishers, identifying, and, and it brings into a lot of transparency. You know where these uh, audiences are coming from, unlike a third party data segment, right? So I think that's the way to go. Michelle? I think if I may add to that question, uh, to that answer, what he just said, when you get your whatever data, your second party data from your publishers on the camp, or whatever that you buy, you got to really uh, try and you know enrich it, or rather identify the attributes of the data. Understand what's been the behavior of this consumer. What are the kind of content that he's consuming? And then next time when you do your campaign, overlay a layer of content on top of it, and probably you'll see a better output or an outcome. Great, thank you. 